First Thessalonians chapter two. We actually there's a we have twelve verses in our text this morning. If you look at the chapter, you'll see that that is more than half of the chapter. First Thessalonians chapter two. We're going to read verses one through twelve together. If you have your Bible, I'd like you to read along with me. If you don't have a Bible, we have some spare Bibles under the chairs for you to use while you're here. If you don't have a Bible at at all. Um, see me after the service, and I will make sure that you know how to get one, okay? Um, in this age of smartphones, I don't understand anybody not having a Bible, okay? It's Amen. pretty simple. Amen. Anyway, First Thessalonians chapter 2, we'll start reading in verse 1 and read down to the end of verse 12, reading together, starting in verse 1, let's read. For yourselves, brethren, know our entrance in unto you, that it was not in vain, but even after that we had suffered before, and were shamefully entreated, as you know, at Philippi, we were bold in our God to speak unto you the gospel of God with much contention. For our exhortation was not of deceit, nor of uncleanness, nor in guile. But as we were allowed of God to be put in trust with the gospel, even so we speak, not as pleasing men, but God which trieth our hearts. For neither at any time used we flattering words, as you know, nor a cloak of covetousness, God is witness. Nor of men sought we glory, neither of you, nor yet of others, when we might have been burdensome as the apostles of Christ. But we were gentle among you, even as a nurse cherisheth her children. So being affectionately desirous of you, we were willing to have imparted unto you, not the gospel of God only, but also our own souls, because ye were dear unto us. For ye remember, brethren, our labor and travail, for laboring night and day, because we would not be chargeable unto any of you. We preached unto you the gospel of God. Ye are witnesses, and God also, how holily and justly and unblameably we behaved ourselves among you that believe. As you know how we exhorted and comforted and charged every one of you, as a father doth his children, that ye would walk worthy of God, who hath called you unto his kingdom and glory. Amen. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your word. Lord, as we read about Paul and how he entered into uh, the city of Thessalonica, and as he ministered to the saints that were there and witnessed to those who were lost, Lord, you would help us see in his life and his approach uh, a pattern uh, that we also could follow as we share, uh, share the, the gospel, your gospel, with those around us. We thank you for your grace. We thank you for your mercy. Give us clarity of thought. Help me to preach. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Uh, 1 Thessalonians chapter 2 is kind of a special chapter to me. Um, I remember... In 1984, sitting at my table and reading my Bible, I was actually studying 1 Thessalonians, and uh, I was reading verse 4, and this is not in the message, this is it'll be in the message later, but I was reading verse 4, and it just really, I, I don't know that I can explain this, um, but it hit me, it hit me hard, and I knew uh, immediately, internally, that God was calling me to preach. And I was really all confused about it because I was a young Christian, didn't know much. And that's why I was reading First Thessalonians because I, there was a lot of things about the Lord's coming I didn't know and I wanted to know. And somebody told me this is the book. So I was studying this book. And that happened and I was like, Lord, you've got the wrong guy. You, got the, you should have sent your angels to the house next door because the guy that led me to the Lord lived next door. So I thought for sure that somehow the messenger got it all mixed up and went to the wrong house. But no, anyway. Um, so, 1 Thessalonians. This, you, if you have your bulletin, you can see the, in the sermon notes there on the, on the side, the title says, How to Witness Like Paul. So the message is obviously going to be about soul winning. The title is a dead giveaway. But I don't want us to get all fired up at the end of this sermon and and rush out and start trying to see how many people we can lead to the Lord. Uh, there's a lot of that sort of thing happening. You know, numbers, numbers, numbers. There's a lot of people just trying to get a lot of numbers. On the one hand, there are certain methods and programs which leads a person into praying a sinner's prayer, and they'll pray the sinner's prayer when there really hasn't been 
any real conviction in their hearts, and that doesn't really produce spiritual results. Nothing ever comes of that. On the other hand, there are these huge mega churches uh, that you can go to and get lost in, or get lost trying to find, you know, find a chair in those places. And they, they bring people in, and a lot of them, I'm not saying mega churches are all this way, but there are a lot of big, huge mega churches that they'll use, uh, you know, music programs or entertainment or, you know, stage lights and even, you know, fog lamps and all kinds of things to try to build up a crowd. And uh, they, they call that trying to reach people. And so the church will have lots of attendees who are not even saved. It doesn't work. God's church is a group of people that are saved at the very least. And there's more to it than that. We'll get to that some other time. Then there are others who will never tell anybody about the Lord at all. And that's not going to do it. That's not a good method of witnessing or evangelism. That will never reach anybody. And so there's a right approach to soul winning. And I think Paul shows us in this chapter the right approach. How to do it. How to witness like Paul. Don't you want to be effective like he was? Yeah. I, I know I do. I would like to go out and lead people to the Lord. Not just pass out papers or books. But I'd like to actually see people get saved. So there is a way, a right way. And I think as we read these first 12 verses that we'll get a sense of Paul's tenderness and his compassion toward the lost. It appears as if someone maybe had accused him of having the wrong motives when he went to Thessalonica. And so in explaining his heart and explaining his approach to them, he ends up telling us 12 things that he did and that I think we should be doing as well. Mature Christians. Hopefully that's what we have here, some mature Christians. Mature Christians and leaders have a responsibility to maintain a constant and consistent example. That's what mature believers are supposed to be. Now, I, I don't think he conscientiously said, okay, guys, I've got a 12-point plan. Let me give you the 12 points. That's not what Paul was doing here. But in explaining his heart, he tells us these 12 things that I hope that I'm able to point out to you. 12 points. Paul mentions that basically you can sort these 12 things into two areas. And I did. If you've got your bulletin, you can see, number one, the state of a heart. Because that's really what it's all about. Then the second point, the state of the art. In other words, what tools did he use? How did he go about doing it? So we will uh, discuss those as we look at them. So moving on, let's go ahead and focus your attention again to 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 2, where we see that in Paul's approach, he first approached sacrificially. Notice in verse 2, but even after we had suffered before, and were shamefully entreated, as you know at Philippi, we were bold in our God to speak unto you the gospel of God with much contention. You might not be familiar with the story, or maybe you are familiar with the story, what happened to Paul when he was in Philippi. He mentions suffering at Philippi. He was doing what he always did. He was in there winning souls to Jesus because that's what Paul did. And as he was doing that, things didn't go well. You can look back in Acts chapter 16 and verse 23 where we find this. This is what it says. It says, And when they had laid many stripes upon them, they cast them into prison, charging the jailer to keep them safely. So this is what happens to Paul. And you read that and you, go, and you think to yourself, well, that doesn't sound like a very successful ministry. I mean, the preacher gets beat and thrown in jail. What would you think if you got the news tomorrow morning that somebody, that the cops grabbed me and then they beat me up for whatever reason and threw me in prison? What would you think about me? Wow, what did he do? Right? You wouldn't think very highly about it. What did Paul do? What was Paul's crime? Well, he led a young girl who was basically a fortune teller. He leads her to the Lord. Then the masters see that because of that, now they're not going to make any money out of it. And because of that, they get everybody all stirred up. And the crowds turn against Paul. He ends up getting beaten, thrown in prison. And now, it's not all bad, okay? As you read through the story, it's not all bad. A couple of people got saved, but there was great contention in the city. People didn't like him anymore. They wanted him to leave town. So 
this is what happens to Paul. So they were, they were only in Philippi for a very short time. And when they leave Philippi, now look, to a lot of folks, you know, that might have looked like a failure. You weren't there very long, only a couple of people get saved, they beat you up, they throw you in jail, they run you out of town. But if you read the epistle to the Philippians, you're going to realize that it was really very effective. You need to understand, first of all, first and foremost, that what you see when you're talking to somebody about Christ is not all there is in the story. <coughs> A lot of guys walk away from that and get saved later. It might be months later or years later. I'm still hoping that someday I'll come across a guy named Dale De Los Santos. If you ever meet him, tell him Jim Taylor was not a waste of his time. Because I gave that guy a run for his money. I gave him a hard time, as much as I possibly could. I'm sure he might have felt that it was all for naught. But I remember him because he left an impact. Because he suffered um, as much as... I could put him through, he suffered. Paul's point here in 1 Thessalonians is even though he had reason to quit, he kept on going. You ever feel like that? You're at work and you're trying to tell somebody about Jesus and they start mocking and laughing at you again. And you feel like quitting? You say, I'm not going to do this again. I'm just not doing this again. And you think in your Bible, a man that's a heretic after the first admonition, reject. I can stop now. I told him twice, it's over. Right? Sometimes we get the feeling that way, but that's not what Paul does. He suffered, yes. He was beaten, yes. He was treated as if he was a common criminal, yes. All of that's true. He was rushed out of the city, run out of the city, basically, yes. That's all true. But folks, that's the way it goes. And I think that that's why some of us actually never get around to speaking for Jesus, because we know that if we do, it's going to cost something. We're going to have to make some sacrifices you're going to have to pay something somewhere along, along the lines. Maybe lose a relationship that we wanted. Or lose a job. Or maybe not get promoted. We know that it's going to cost something and so we don't want to do it. One of the first things that we have to overcome in our Christian walk is our fear of man. I mean, we fear men. All of us. Probably the biggest guys in our church, brother, I don't know if it's brother Caleb or brother Derek, where is he, brother Derek, one of these two guys. Um, I, Derek, I think, may weigh more, but are you taller? Yeah, probably take anybody in this church, right? You know you want to say yes, just say it, just say it. Probably, but I bet it is still possible for him to get in a situation where witnessing becomes a challenge because he knows he's going to have to pay. It happens. We don't like to sacrifice. Paul was in a tough spot. In their journey, he's in a tough spot. The authorities had treated him illegally, by the way. And as a result, they wanted to get him out of town quietly. They wanted to you know, kind of sneak him out, if you will. Oh, Paul, please, can you leave? Just kind of slip out. And Paul's like, oh, no, 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 no. You're going to come in, and you're going to apologize, and then we will leave. I mean, that's in the JPP, the Jim's Paraphrase Version. In those days, you couldn't treat a Roman citizen the way they treated Paul. And so they were going to try to cover things up. Now, to a lot of folks, it might have looked like a failure, but it was a great success. Now, the gospel message, which is what we're supposed to use, by the way, more about that later, the gospel message is never going to be popular. It's never been popular before. Nothing we do is going to make it popular. Facebook is not going to make your testimony popular. Twitter, you can Twitter and tweet all you want. That's not going to make the testimony popular. You can, you can do advertisements. You can smile. You can shake hands. You can kiss babies or kiss hands and shake babies. It doesn't matter. Nothing you do is going to make your witness popular. You're going to be unpopular if you're doing your job. The gospel message is just that way. For every soul that gets saved, there are going to be many more who will reject the gospel, and in doing so also reject you, and if possible, make you pay. So the question is, are you willing to sacrifice? In, in Thessalonica, it wasn't a cakewalk. We're not going to read this, but if you remember from last week, we, or a couple of weeks ago, we read in Acts chapter 17, verses 1 through 10, all that happened in Thessalonica... At the end of all that Paul did, we read in verses 9 and 10 that they took security of Jason 
And the other they let him go, and the brethren immediately sent Paul away, and Silas by night unto Berea, who coming thither went into the synagogue of the Jews. Same thing happens again in Thessalonica. They go in there, he's there for a couple of weeks, three weeks, maybe four, who knows, or close to four. And they don't like him preaching, and they run him out of town again. This is how Paul managed to go from one place to another. He stayed until they ran him away. And they ran him away. But Paul's point was, even though they knew that it was not going to get better, they still made the sacrifice and kept on going anyway, sacrificially. And that leads me to the next point. How was it that they spoke? Back in 1 Thessalonians chapter 2 and verse 2, he says, We were bold in our God to speak unto you the gospel of God with much contention. We were bold. Bold. He didn't mean abrasive. I've met people that are abrasive in witnessing. I've gone out with folks, you know, and they can be abrasive in witnessing. God doesn't want us to be abrasive. He does want us to be direct. He does want us to have courage, but he doesn't want us to be abrasive. You know, sandpaper personality. I'll never forget, I was sitting in an airport in Oakland, California in the days when we actually flew through Oakland. And I was, I was traveling back from Korea with my family, my wife, and my two kids who grew up in South Korea, having never experienced a lot of the stuff that you can find in California. Anybody here from California? Okay, brother, don't take this offensively, but that is the land of the fruits, nuts, and flakes, okay? That is the granola state, all right? So we land there, we get there late, we gotta, you know, we miss our connection, so I'm up there, I'm in line trying to get us all figured out, you know, and get us a new connection. I was traveling with a friend of mine, and uh, I looked over, I remember standing in line and looking over, and I see my, my, my kids, my kids are sitting over here, there's chairs that face each other. My kids are sitting over here, and their eyes are like this big around, they're like, because they're seeing something they've never seen before. Sitting so right on the other side of the aisle was a couple of girls acting like a girl and a guy. You know what I'm saying? You know what I mean? Anyway, and my buddy went over there and shoved a track between their lips. Now, I didn't know how I felt about that at the time. I was kind of glad. I didn't really want my kids to see it. But I'm pretty sure that didn't leave a good lasting impression on them either. You know what I'm saying? probably wasn't exactly the best approach. Um, Paul doesn't want us, if Paul didn't go in abrasively, he, if he needed to talk about hell, he talked about hell. If he needed to address a controversial subject, he did that. Folks, it's hard sometimes to talk about something that's sensitive or controversial. You know that it's going to bring offense, and you know that people aren't going to like it. But here's the key. If we'll humble ourselves before God... And then we can walk boldly in God. Then we can be whatever we need to be before men. We can be before men. We can be bold if we'll be humble before God. Paul tells us in one place that he was beaten with rods on three occasions. Once would have been enough for most of us. Notice I said us. Once would have been enough for most of us. We'd quit. But no, he goes through it three times. Philippi was one of those three occasions. He tells us that. In 2 Corinthians chapter 11 and verse 25, he says, Thrice was I beaten with rods, once was I stoned, thrice suffered shipwreck, a day and night have I been in the deep. He was beaten with rods, and then he goes to Thessalonica. You know he's not feeling real good. But what does he do? He preaches. Hello? Anybody out there, you, you've said this maybe, or, you know, this is your pocket excuse. I was tired. So that's why. I didn't go. I was tired, so I didn't go to church today. I don't care how tired you are. Tell it to Paul, who got beat by rods and then still went to the next city anyway and preached anyway. Don't tell me how tired you are. I'm tired too. The whole world is tired. I get up at 6 o'clock in the morning. I'm going all day. I'm tired. You say, so what? I get the fuck. Fine. You beat me up. But the fact is, I came, I came to church. So don't tell me how tired you are. The reason why you don't have any sacrificial witness is because you don't have any sacrificial living in your life. You don't live for the Lord sacrificially, so you're certainly not going to witness sacrificially. And if you don't do that, you're certainly not going to have the boldness you need. Paul went on, he was bold anyway. You cannot read about the exploits of Paul 
without coming away with a sense of awe. You read about Paul and you go, wow, look at what he did. Look at, look at that. Look at the, the results that came out of that. Incredible. You know, faces a howling mob. I wouldn't want to do that, but he did. Speaks bluntly to authorities. Would you like to be able to tell the president? I mean, whether you like him or don't like him, I would just love to say, you know, President Trump, if you give your life to Jesus, he could help you control your, your mouth. Amen. I would love to do that. I would love the opportunity to tell him about the Lord. Paul did that. When he got a chance, he told people about the Lord, even those in authority over him. He was, I'm sure, at points afraid, intimidated, but he was, he was very bold in speaking the gospel. Personally, I hate conflict, don't you? I don't like to rub people the wrong way. I don't like it when people don't like me. I don't like it when I'm preaching... And I see somebody go, but you know what I've learned? Usually that means that the Holy Spirit is beating them upside the head with something, and I just keep on going. In fact, I start going a little bit harder, because I'm hoping that maybe I can crack through and get through. This is what we read about with Paul, and I read that, and I go, wow, I want to be like that. But you know what? If you want to be bold like that, you're going to have to be humble before God like Paul was. That's the key. And this is, this is the truth for all of us. Any boldness that we have in the area of soul winning should be the grace of God at work and not us at work. Amen. The work of the flesh will never bring spiritual results. Number three, 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, and verse 3, Paul says this, For our exhortation was not of deceit, nor of uncleanness, nor of guile. In other words, he was honest. He mentions not of deceit. In other words, not trying to trick anybody. Not of uncleanness, in other words, his message was pure, not such as to lead to an impure life, not giving a license to sin, but leading to holiness and purity, and not in guile. Guile is, by the way, if you study guile, you'll find out it's specifically a sin of the lips. Guile is expressed with the mouth. So the idea is that they didn't speak in any way in order to deceive them or to fool them. No craftiness, no dishonesty, but honesty. This is the way they approached. He wasn't peddling his own man-made religion. You see a lot of that today. you got the New Age gurus, psychics who call themselves prophets, you know, uh, in the National Enquirer, you know, all those guys making all their predictions. you got the Hare Krishnas in the airports, uh, the followers of Sun Young Moon. Uh, in Korea, you call it Moon Sun Young. Um, Mormons, Jehovah's Witnesses, and so many more that are out there peddling a false religion. Don't give those guys your time of day, by the way. All right? You know the truth. If they don't, don't waste your time listening to what they have to say. You know, I know some people say, well, you know, you can, you, can find, you can find something good in just about everything. Right. So go to the book because it's filled with something good. There's nothing bad there. You won't make a mistake. Okay? <laughs> Stick to the book. It'll do you good. I've seen men who preach the truth using all kinds of gimmicks and, and trickery in order to build up their own ministries and make themselves look good, in order to uh, you know, make a name for themselves, these, these people are, are not godly people. They're not. And you can, you can try to hold them up on a pedestal and argue all you want to, but folks, listen, those people are not godly people. And I'm not trying to judge anyone's salvation because I know some men that I believe are saved who are still approaching ministry with the wrong kind of methods. But look, don't come to me and try to tell me how good Joel Osteen is. You know, I, I don't want to hear it. I don't care. All right? He, he can go out and do his own thing. His best life is now. My best life is coming. It's mm -hmm. called heaven. All right? I'm not wasting my time on that. But folks, when we go out soul winning, our only true motive is their salvation. Amen. Amen. That's it. Let's not resort to trickery in order to supposedly you know, build up the kingdom. It doesn't work that way. That's not God's method. Okay? Look at 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 5. We'll see the next point. Sincerity. Paul says, For neither at any time used we flattering words, as you know, nor a cloak of covetousness, God is witness. You know what flattery is? Flattery is when you're trying to make a favorable impression 
for selfish motives. Right? I, I don't like flattery, but then I do. You know? You know, it's like, oh, stop. Please stop. 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 Stop saying nice things about me. Stop. You know, we, we love to be flattered, and we know people like that, so we tell them what we know they want to hear with a selfish purpose. You know what it's all about? It's the guy that's saying nice things to you in order to manipulate you in some way, to get something out of you. That's what flattery is. But what's a book of covetousness? Covetousness. Well, it's when someone covers up their true actions or their true intentions, I should say, because what they really want is something that you have. You know, I thought when I I thought when I went into the ministry, I thought that that kind of stuff, you know, that happens in the world. You know, that stuff happens in business in the world. I, but I didn't know it happened in the ministry until I was in the ministry, and I realized that it happens. I know some people who are just backbiters and who are liars, and who are selfish, self-centered jerks, who go around trying to tear down everybody else that's doing anything because they figure if they can bring them down, that'll make them look good. And they'll, they'll go around trying to, specifically, trying to hurt other ministries in order to build their own. I know people like that. You like to say, what, that happens? Yes, they're approaching ministry with a cloak of covetousness. And it's wrong. <coughs> you guys, it, you know, I've been in situations where here we are at church, our church, trying to, on a Friday night, have a good men's night, where the ladies are trying to have a good Bible study, and then some so-called preachers across town giving guitar lessons on the same night, knowing good and well that he's pulling people out of church to do it. Folks, that kind of ministry is not ministry. That's manipulation. That's when somebody is trying to build themselves up while tearing somebody else down. Now, let's be totally transparent here for a moment. You say, weren't you transparent enough? Well, not totally. I think everybody would like to have a bigger congregation, wouldn't you? I mean, I'd like to see these chairs filled. We need, you know, five or six people sitting over here. We could use a couple sitting there and three or four sitting over there, right? Wouldn't you like that? I know I would. I, I would love... To have a full, I would love to have every chair filled with somebody. Any preacher that says otherwise is lying to you. Okay, every preacher I know wants his church to be full. But it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter if you are the pastor or the person in the pew. You know that you would love to see these chairs full, right? But how do we do it? What's going to be our approach? Are we going to trick them in, pandering to their flesh? Or are we going to do it by prayer and, and do it by preaching and do it from the heart? Is that how we're going to do it? Because there's God's way and then there's man's way and man's way is ineffective. Oh yeah, you can fill the chairs, but you won't make the church better. You'll actually make it worse. Because you fill the chairs with people who have no spiritual desire at all. Now let's look at another one. 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 6. Humbly. Paul says, not of men sought we glory, neither of you nor yet of others. When we might have been burdensome as the apostles of Christ. Now Paul said he didn't seek any glory or praise of men. You might remember from verse 4, it's because he sought to please the Lord. We'll come back to that verse later. And that's the whole point. The com common sense would tell us that a, a lot of folks would have spoken quite highly of Paul. If he came in through our doors, I, I would step down and sit in the first row and listen to him preach. That's how much I think about that man. Of course, that's never going to happen. You know what Paul would do if he were alive today? He'd be scratching on the top of his casket. Anyway, <laughs> moving on. Uh, common sense. L listen, it's not wrong for you know for you to say something nice to anyone. That's not my point. It's not wrong to receive praise from men, especially if you did a good job and somebody wants to thank you for it, fine. But good work ought to be, and good work ought to be praised, but good work ought to be to the praise of God. When somebody says something good to you, like, boy, you did a great job in that piano special or whatever it was, why don't you turn that around and say, to God be the glory. To God be the glory. And not take the praise to ourselves. 
That would be the humble thing to do. Paul could have gone to Thessalonica, won some souls to Jesus, and after he won some souls to Jesus, said, now look, I'm an apostle, so you better listen to me, and you better do what I say, and by the way, you need to support me too. He could have done that. He makes that point clear. He says, we might have been burdensome as the apostles of Christ, in verse 6, but that wasn't his approach. That's not what he did. The ministry was not about Paul. It was about Christ. He didn't want to detract from the word uh, by, his, by his own personal desires. And I know people, and you do too, who will not do certain things, will not work for Jesus, because they won't get any praise for it. Nobody wants to clean the... Anybody here want to clean the toilet? Don't raise your hand. It's easy to say you want to. No, let's do this. Anybody here want to clean the toilet for Jesus? Anybody? Jesus? Yeah, for Jesus. Talk to Brother Oak. He'll be glad to hook you up. Okay? Hey. All right? Any, anybody, here want to, anybody here want to take out the trash and scrub the floors for Jesus? You know, it's hard to find those kind of volunteers. How about this? Anybody want to go shopping and eat pizza for Jesus? All expenses paid by the church, amen? Yeah. You get all kinds of volunteers for that. Amen. Humbly. It's not about whether anybody thought Paul was a good Christian or not. It was all about the Lord. So let me ask you. Yeah. Can you do whatever it is you're doing for the Lord? When you go out on those weekend evangelistic uh, endeavors that we as a church have, why? Why are you doing it? What's going on in your heart? What's your motive? You're trying to look good? You're trying to impress somebody? Because if you are, don't go. Stay at home. You're working in the flesh, and that which is of the flesh is sin. All right? We need to get our motives right. Then we can work like Paul. Notice this in 1 Thessalonians 2.7. We're moving on for number 6 now. Tenderly. 1 Thessalonians 2.7. But we were gentle among you, even as a nurse cherished her children. I've met some pretty tough nurses in the military. Right? And at the lighthouse, we have, a, we have a, a nurse, a famous nurse. Her name is Olga. Yeah. Olga, uh, you know, it's just a made-up nurse. It's not a real person. But, but I've met some pretty tough nurses in my time, especially in the military. Because in the military, there's a three-step process to heal anything and everything. If you're in the military, you know this. Get them in, give them Motrin, get them back to work. That's a three-step process. The cure-all cure all is Motrin. Not a whole lot of gentleness there, but a nurse as we know, is somebody who is gentle, tender, especially toward her own child, even as a nurse cherisheth her own children. It's a sensitive love, a, a tender care that we have. Is that your approach when you approach somebody who is lost? It's the love of a mother coupled with, with the care of a nurse. Is that your approach when you speak with the loss. Sometimes love has to be strong. I know that. It has to be tough. I understand that sometimes. But with some people, it's not sometimes. With some people, it's all the time. And it's almost like we, we take a certain joy or a certain pleasure in being hard. I don't think that was Paul's approach. He says, we were gentle among you, even as a nurse cherisheth her children. When you think of the character of Christ, do you think of somebody who is hard? Somebody who is abrasive? I hope not. You say, well, pastor, right there in Matthew chapter 23, he preaches pretty hard there. Yeah, he did. And sometimes he did. But most of the time, he did not. Most of the time, he was gentle. He came as a nurse caring for her children. This was Paul's heart delighted to minister to their needs. And this is something that spiritual leaders ought to know. It ought to, ought to be this way. Uh, biblical pastors love their people. And they try to lead them with tenderness and compassion. They, they might have authority. And you know sometimes I can be a bit direct. And, <coughs> no, no, no. Um, I can be a bit direct. And I will be direct if I feel like I need to. But most of the time, I like to think that there's a certain tenderness and compassion that's supposed to be among the leadership. Because that's the way Paul did it. 
And that's the way we ought to do it. it it's not enough just to lead somebody to Christ. We, we have to help them grow. As a nurse cherishes her own children, by the way, the word there for nurse can also refer to someone who is nursing a child. The same word is used in that sense as well. Whether it's the mother or a nanny or somebody else, the idea of a nurse is one who is nourishing a babe and trying to help them grow. So, are we doing that as a church? Because whether you remember or not, three or four weeks ago, we had three people get saved. Brand new Christians. Then what? The week right after that, they got baptized and joined the church. Brand new Christians. So we're done now, right? We can let them fly on their own. No, we are not. Most certainly not. We are just beginning to work. The truth is, now we have to take care of them. We have to help them. And they want it. Believe me. It's not enough just to lead them to Christ. We need to be helping them grow. And how do we do that? Same way Paul did, with love and tenderness. Moving on, number seven. 1 Thessalonians chapter 2 and verse 8. Personally. And I love this verse. Notice what it says. So being affectionately desirous of you, we were willing to have imparted unto you, not the gospel of God only, but also our own souls. Because you were dear unto us. Our own souls. He gave up himself. Personally, he personally invested his life into theirs. In a world where the common philosophy is to throw resources at a problem in order to bring a solution, God has asked us to give of ourselves. What we need is a personal one-to-one -one touch. You know, sometimes people ask me, and, I, and you know this, I explained this to you a while back, but... Some people want to know why we keep going back to the same villages again and again and again. Because we learned a long time ago that blanketing a, a, you know, a Buddhist area... Look, if you grew up in a village that's been Buddhist for 500 years, and everybody around you is Buddhist, and that's the way they were raised, and that's the way you think, do you think that you're going to change religions in five minutes because some white guy from the city came and gave you a track? That's not happening, folks. It takes a personal touch. They have to see you. It has to be real. All right? So that's, that's what we need. These people have personal needs, and Paul wanted to help them personally. Nothing beats a bit of one-on-one -on -one discipleship. Do you have somebody you're trying to help? Can you think of somebody in your mind right now that you're trying to help? You say, well, I'm trying to help everybody, Pastor. No, I'm talking about that one person that is yours. That's your responsibility. You should be trying to help somebody like that. And somebody ought to be helping you like that. That's the way discipleship works. Paul says he was affectionately desirous of them. That's kind of an unusual phrase because it's not found anywhere else in the Bible as far as I could find. But what it means is a literal yearning, a loving for them. Now I know this feeling. It's a feeling that pastors get. It's a desire to help. It's a desire to be a blessing or to, to teach or to lead others closer to the Lord. That's that affectionately desirous part that he was talking about. It's a desire to see others grow and go in the right direction. But folks, this needs to be a desire of every believer to see the guy next to you, everybody look left. If you're over here and you're looking at the wall, I'm sorry. Everybody look right. No, that doesn't fix it either, does it? Everybody look at somebody else. Do you want them to grow? Amen? Do you want them to grow, yes or no? Yes. And what are you doing about it? Right? Because that's the big question. If I want somebody to grow or to become a better Christian, if I really have, as Paul said, if there is an affectionate desire toward them, what am I doing to help them? Or how about this? Some of you young people, I'm not picking on young people. I used to be one. Thankfully, I outgrew that. But anyway, that was a joke. You can laugh now. Now, young, young people, I've noticed sometimes with young people that one young Christian will walk the line. You know what I mean? And they're not satisfied to walk the line alone. They want to encourage their friend to walk the line with them. 
Listen carefully. You need to draw your friends closer to Jesus, not put them in harm's way. All right? If your friend is trying to draw you the wrong way, you need to be pulling on them to get them back where they need to be. And by the way, your friends need to be Christians. All right? Your friends need to be Christians. You ought to desire that they grow closer to Christ. Number eight, diligently. 1 Thessalonians chapter 2 and verse 9. For you remember, brethren, our labor and travail. I don't like those words. I don't like labor. I don't like travail. You know what I like? I like lawn chairs. Amen. I like glasses of peach tea. I like a good book. That's what I like. But Paul says, labor and travail. And then he goes on. He says, not only just for a couple minutes, but he says, for laboring night and day. Because we would not be chargeable unto any of you, we preached unto you the gospel of God. You might remember that Paul was a tent maker. That was his job. He made tents. He probably learned this as a child from his father. And now, as a traveling missionary, it's a skill that's coming in quite handy. Because when he doesn't have support and he gets hungry, he makes a tent, takes the money, and feeds himself. Or maybe he makes a tent, takes the money, feeds himself, and then and buys some material he's going to use in his ministry. I don't know. But Paul labored and travailed night and day. And he says, because we would not be chargeable unto any of you. In other words, we didn't want to take your money. We weren't after that. I know some folks frown on missionaries taking up local employment. They say, you know, why should a pastor have another job or something like that? You know, I, I know pastors that work. And uh, I, the ones that I know that work have a need to work. Mm -hmm. You know, they've got a church of 20 people and they can't, the church can't even hardly support itself, much less take care of the pastor. He has to feed the family somehow. And he does that so he can stay there and continue to be a pastor. Because it would be very easy for him to say, oh, I'm getting nothing out of this and I'm going to move on. Or the Lord has called me. You know, I've noticed this. A lot of pastors, they get called to bigger churches with more money and a better parsonage and a bigger car and all that. They rarely ever get called the other way. Has anybody besides me ever noticed that? No one ever gets called to a smaller church. I know I'm being general. I know what happens. I understand. You can come up with your stories and tell me later. But you understand the point, right? But that wasn't Paul's point. Now, what, what else can I take away from this? That mission work is often hard. Sometimes it's not fun. But a real minister of the gospel, a real witness, is not afraid to do something that's a bit hard. You know, in the summer, in the summer in Kunsan, Kunsan's weather is amazing. Because we get all four seasons plus some. You know what I mean? If you don't like the weather in Kunsan, wait a week and it will be totally different. That's the reality. Okay? But I know that there's a period during the summer when it is so hot and so humid. You say, how is that? Because in the winter it's so cold and so dry, and now it's so hot and so humid, you don't want to go outside. And you don't want to stay inside. And you just want to sit in a cold shower all day. You know? You don't want to do anything. But you've got to. Right? You say, well, i got to go to work. Yes, you do. And you also got to be a witness. Right? Yeah. So, when we get to the end of July and the first part of August, I hope that we still have as good a turnout for Bible Blitz as we do right now. I hope that none of us will say, oh, it's too hot and muggy out there. I'm not going to do it. Well, look, I understand, you know, if it's hot and muggy, that a lot of other people might not be out there either. So, there's a little wisdom in that. But, you know, don't let that be your motive. I just want to be comfortable. I want to work for Jesus when it's fun. Those times come, but most of the time it's just hard work. All right? It, is it bad for a guy to have a desk job? No. That's not my point. Is it a bad thing for somebody to be, you know, a softy or, as we like to say in the Air Force, a non-er? No. You need yes. those guys. No, no, no. You know? At least the non-ers want us to think that. But uh, no. the bottom line is, you know, that's the, the bottom line is this. What are you willing to do for Jesus? Are you willing to do the hard things? It's, it's going to come. Look at 1 Thessalonians chapter 2 and verse 10. We as a church, we need to be able to do whatever, whatever is legally and ethically and morally right, whatever it may be, in order to reach the lost. All right? Now notice this. 1 Thessalonians chapter 2 and verse 10, purely. 
Ye are witnesses, and God also, how holily and justly and unblameably we behaved ourselves among you that believe. Holy and justly and unblameably. Sometimes I think that that's almost redundant. You know, if you're holy, you're the other two already, right? But he uses these three terms specifically. We're to live, we, we are living in a day right now when churches are taught that we have to be worldly in order to reach the world. That is counterproductive. Some of you sitting there right now say, Amen, bre bre preacher. No, no offense, Brother Jed, but some of you say, Amen, preacher, but, but you're doing it. You're doing it. You, you got your worldly music with Jesus thrown in every now and then, and you think that's okay. Your worldly fashion, and you think that that's okay. It's not okay. We're Christians. We're supposed to be different. Talk about how much you hate the world and how much you hate the devil, and, and yet you're trying to dress up in his team's colors. You're wearing his team's uniform. Does that make sense? No. We're taught that we must do what they do so that we can be more approachable. And honestly, I want to be approachable. I really do. But we can't ever allow ourselves to stoop down when it comes to our spirituality. We have to challenge them to rise up. Holiness, that's a big word. Integrity, that's a big word. And they're in short supply nowadays. But what does the scripture say? I'm going to read these things off to you very quickly. I'll give you the reference and I'll read it to you. You don't have to try and follow this, but I want to make a point here. Okay? Listen to these verses. And I'm not even going to read the whole verse in most cases, so... You know, by the time you get there, I'll be gone, all right? So just listen for a moment. Exodus 19, 6. And ye shall be unto me a kingdom of priests and an holy nation. Leviticus chapter 19 and verse 2. Ye shall be holy, for I, the Lord your God, am holy. Leviticus chapter 20, verse 26. And ye shall be holy unto me, for I, the Lord, am holy. Numbers 15, verse 40. That ye may remember and do all my commandments and be holy. Unto the Lord your God. Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 4. That we should be holy and without blame before him in love. 1 Peter chapter 1 verses 15 and 16. But as he which hath called you is holy, so be ye holy in all manner of conversation. Because it's written, be ye holy. Revelation chapter 22 verse 11. He that is holy, let him be holy still. I, I don't know. I might be stepping out on a limb here. But I just get this feeling deep down inside that God wants me to be holy. Amen? Amen. He repeats himself over and over and over and over and over. There's a lot more verses I could have used. I thought these just had some good short phrases I could throw out there. So I think the Bible is pretty clear. God wants me to be holy. Paul said that. That the Thessalonians could see how they lived, that they lived a holy life. And this is the way it has to be. Think about it. How can you tell people that Jesus saves from sin if you continue to walk in sin? If they do not see it in your life, how are they going to want, how are they going to believe that it actually frees? Right? 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 11, number 10. As you know, how we exhorted and comforted and charged every one of you, charged every one of you as a father doth his children. This is authoritatively. Never forget that you are a spiritual father of sorts. And you need to help others with the voice of authority. What does a father do? He encourages his children. He comforts his children. And he commands his children. And that's exactly what Paul did. I, you know, my dad, he was, he was good at, at, at issuing commands. He had no problem with that. He told me things that I was going to do, and I did it. Because if I didn't do it, I knew I was going to have to face the wrath of dad. My daughter called me something this morning. I thought it was so funny. She called me. Uh, I said something to my son in our chat room. You know, we, anyway, that's a long story. But she called me. The, the dad of thunder. She said, the dad of thunder has spoken. I like it too. I said, that's great. Is that on a t-shirt? Because I, I, I want a t-shirt that says, dad of thunder. You know, fun. Anyway, um, authority. 
You might find it interesting to know that the Greek word for exhort is the word parakaleo. Does that sound familiar? I kind of didn't pronounce it the Greek way because that way you might not ever understand it. Parakaleo, that might sound like another word to you, maybe paraclete. Does that, anybody know that word, paraclete? Yeah, you find it in John chapter 14, 15, and 16, referring to the Holy Spirit, and it's usually, it's, it's almost always translated, at least there, as comforter. Mm -hmm. All right? It's used five times, this word, parakaleo. The noun form is the word parakletos, and it's used five times in the Bible. It's always applied to the Holy Spirit. It means a comforter, an encourager, an advocate, one called alongside of. So the root word, the root word means to encourage, to comfort, to literally walk alongside in the sense of taking them from one step to the next, each step along the way. That's what exhorting is all about. So do you encourage others to take this next step for Christ? Do you do that? Do you even know what the next step is supposed to be? Because this is important stuff. This is what we're supposed to be doing. This is what Paul was doing. The next thing Paul said was that he comforted them. This is a different word. It's paramutheomai. Say that five times back. Paramutheomai. Anyway, the idea is that of consolation. Okay? It's related in that sense. When the world, the flesh, and the devil starts to beat up those new believers and start to get them down, pick them up! That's what somebody did for me. I remember a couple of weeks after I got saved, I was... I was, in, you know, been in trouble because of my past life. You know, bad things I did when I was lost. And I'm in the truck, I'm riding with a Christian brother, and he's taking me up to see the, the commander and the first sergeant. And I know I'm in big trouble for something that I quit doing because I got saved. But now it's catching up to me. And I'm sitting there shaking my head. I said, I don't, I don't know what's going on here. I just, I'm trying to live for the Lord now, and everything is... And I was so distraught. I was so discouraged. I was, I was so upset. And he's just driving along. He looks over at me and he says, don't you, don't you know that God's in control now? Why don't you just relax and let him do his thing? Not exactly deep theology, but surely enough for me. I was like, huh, yeah. You know, as it turned out, the day turned out pretty good after all. Why don't we learn to do that? Why don't we learn to help somebody? Paul said that he charged them. He exhorted them, he comforted them, but he charged them. In other words, there were times when he spoke with the authority of God's word and says, thus saith the Lord. And this is what you need to do. Spiritual leaders do that sometimes. Here the Greek word is the word martyrio, which is the same word that we translate as witness or testify or martyr. So it's not just speaking with authority of something, you know, recorded. It's, it's not that idea. It's speaking from the assurance of a life that has experienced the same grace and gone through the same troubles, and now we know what we're speaking of because we've been there. We are sharing of ourselves, remember, with them from the Word of God. And we're speaking with authority both from the Scriptures and because we've been there and we know. That's what witnessing is all about. We're faced with a world filled with great spiritual danger. Trials, crises, war, turmoil, sorrows, and all those things. And You know, it, to me, it's an exciting time to be a witness. Yeah, it's dangerous, but it's an exciting time as well. And we need to tell them that. Now let's look at the next point, the state of the art. The state of the art, using the right message, 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 4. It's my life verse. If you go up to the office, you'll see it on my wall. The guy that did the interior asked me what my life verse was. I told him that. I didn't know what he was going to do with it. I just told him. He put it up on a big old plaque and he put it up on the wall. So I see it every time I walk in there. My life verse. But as we were allowed of God to be put in trust with the gospel of God, even so we speak. Not as pleasing men, but God which trieth our hearts. Using the right message. Paul wasn't seeking to tickle anybody's ears. He's not trying to build his church, but he's, he's not trying to appeal to man, but to God. He's trying to please God. He was trustworthy. He was put in trust with the gospel. Has anybody ever trusted you with something very expensive or very fragile or 
or, or something very precious to them. They gave it to you and they said, can you keep this for me for a little while? I, I want you to, and, and you're like, well, I'm very, very careful with this. God has entrusted us with the gospel. He's placed it in our hands. It's worth more than all this world has to offer. A life-changing message. A ministry given to us. And, and Paul says that God tried his heart. Did you notice that? It's the idea of being approved. God has approved of Paul as a minister to preach the gospel. Can God say the same thing about me? That's why that means so much to me, because every time I see that verse, I'm, I'm challenged with this whole idea that it's God which trieth our hearts. Am I worthy? That's a challenge. But it's one that we're supposed to live up to. The message was not Paul's personal conviction or his opinion. It was God's message. He delivered it God's way. He speaks of the gospel four times, by the way. Four times in this passage, verse 2, verse 4, verse 8, verse 9. That's what we use. Cute little stories never saved anybody. You know why? Because power is not in the story. Nice little <coughs> poems never saved anybody. Do you know why? Because power is not in the poem. Somebody please tell me, where can I find the power? If we don't know, we're in trouble. The power is found in the Word of God. The Word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword in Hebrews 4.12. That's why we use it. That's what it is. You're not going to see people get saved if you're not using the Word of God. It's pretty simple. And we've been given an honor. An honor to carry a message that is so valuable, worth more than anything else the world could ever offer. A message full of power. Now look at verse 12. Having the right goal. 1 Thessalonians chapter 2 and verse 12. That ye would walk, that ye would walk worthy of the Lord. You notice he says this. He says, I did all this, I told y'all this, that ye would walk worthy of the Lord. You could just say so that, and it's basically the same thing. Everything that he did, the goal was so that they could walk worthy of God, who had called you into his kingdom and glory. That's his goal. His goal was not to fill up empty chairs in the pew. His goal was not to make a name for himself as a great soul winner or an evangelist. No, it was simply that they would walk worthy of God. In other words, Paul wanted them to live consistently and obediently before the Lord. That's his goal. The Bible tells us three places, three places in the New Testament where we find this idea of walking worthy. First of all, in Ephesians 4.1, it says, I therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you that you walk worthy of the vocation wherewith you are called. Vocation. What's a, what's a vocation? Some people read that and they say walk worthy of the vacation. That's not it. <laughs> walk worthy of your vocation. The interesting thing here is it's translated from the Greek word. The Greek word is the word klesis, which means your calling. Klesis is translated calling in every place except here. Do you know that you have a calling from the Lord? God called you. You're to walk worthy of that. In other words, live up to what you really are. If you're a child of God, live like one. To walk worthy means to walk appropriately. Your life ought to look like a Christian's life. What does a Christian look like? You ought to be different. It's pretty simple. Number two, walk worthy of the Lord. Colossians 1.10. <laughs> Colossians 1.10, that she may walk worthy of the Lord unto all pleasing, being fruitful in every good work and increasing. Uh, walk worthy of the Lord unto all pleasing. Paul prayed that the church in Coloss might have wisdom and they might have understanding. But why? So that they could become great intellects? No. I, I know some great intellects, and I have to tell you that some of them, their brains get in the way of their faith. It, it's true. They need wisdom, but they need God's wisdom. For what purpose? So that they can walk worthy. So you be the kind of Christian they're supposed to be. So the question is, and this is a serious question, are you a proper representative of the Lord before the world? Because you're supposed to be His ambassador, speaking not your words, but His words, in His place, you're here, in God's stead. What kind of ambassador are you? I went to the security forces squadron a few months ago and I was trying to 
uh, you know, get in and, and talk to somebody, and they, they were telling me that something was going on, and, and I said, but I'm an ambassador. And they said, hold on a minute, let me make a phone call. I said, no, no, I'm just kidding, man. <laughs> and I moved on, you know. But, but folks, if you are an ambassador, you may have authority, but you also have responsibility <laughs> to be their representative just the way they would do it if they were there. Going back to that whole thing, what would Jesus do, right? And then third, 1 Thessalonians chapter 2 and verse 12, that you would walk worthy of God who have called you unto his kingdom and glory. And that pretty much uh, is the same thing as walking worthy of the Lord, to walk worthy of God, where we strive not to bring reproach to his name. And here's the conclusion. If you want to witness like Paul, then you've got to follow Paul's example. You have to do it Paul's way. And as I read through this passage, I see a man who's filled with faithful. I don't see a man who has a checklist. I see a man that has a heart. And if we're going to do it Paul's way, then we have to develop that heart. That heart for God is what we need. Let's all stand, every head bowed, every eye closed. That's what we need if we want to be a witness like Paul was. 1 Thessalonians chapter 2. As the piano begins to play, let me ask you a question. How effective have you been as a witness this week? I'm not asking you if you've led millions to the Lord, or thousands, or hundreds, or even tens. I'm just asking you whether or not you've been doing your job. If you know that you've fallen short of that, I would ask you this morning to just go ahead and purpose in your heart to do differently. The altar's open if God has spoken to your heart. Won't you come? See, I want to be a better witness. I want to see folks saved and I have not been approaching the Lord the right way. Would you come pray about that? I've not been the, the child of God I needed to be. I've been abrasive and not compassionate. Would you come and pray about that? Whatever God has said to you, you need to take care of it. This series in 1 Thessalonians, we're going to cover a lot of territory and a whole lot of things. Start now surrendering to the Lord. I'm sure make it a whole lot easier in the future. Has the Lord laid opportunity before you? Say, I can't do it. Yes, you can. You don't do it anyway. If you're doing it for the Lord, He's doing it. Just let Him have it. I can't. I don't know how to talk to them. show you if you give a chance. Would you just surrender?